Please take your Bibles and turn with me back there, if you will, to the book of Galatians. Our text today, Galatians chapter 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 1. I think it's appropriate on Independence Day Sunday to ask the question, free to do what? Free to do what? We are exhorted to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. So to stand fast in that liberty, to know what that freedom is that we have, we need to understand what that liberty entails and what it does not entail. Too many Christians even feel that they must have freedom to do whatever they want and they are no longer entangled with all of those things of the past and so they can do anything that they very well choose to do. But as we read through that, you probably noticed several things. You notice that he talked about being justified by the law. And he used the illustration that we've talked about in Acts chapter 15, which was a very hot topic back in the early church, which was the issue of circumcision. But he makes the statement that if they go back under the law and attempt to be justified, that is, declared righteous, by having kept some part of the law, you are fallen from grace. There was a great war going on in the early church. There's a great war going on today between what is true Christian liberty and whether or not believers are under the law, at least in some sense. And the Apostle Paul is striving to teach a balance in the book of Galatians. The heresy that we see the, the church facing in Acts chapter 15 had spread from Jerusalem all across the ancient world and the churches of Galatia, we would know it as ancient Gaul and spreading not just through Turkey but all the way across into Europe and reaching into France and Germany and Italy, there was a group of so-called missionaries who now claimed to be from the church at Jerusalem and who were carrying a false doctrine, in some cases apostasy, in some cases heresy, but a false doctrine saying that either you needed certain aspects of the law to be saved, that's apostasy, or you needed certain aspects of the law to be sanctified, that's heresy. There is a technical difference between the two. And so the book of Galatians is written to reach all those churches where this heresy is gone. And the warfare that is going on is between law and grace between faith and works. It's not to say that we as believers have no standards. The libertines say that there are no standards now because we're free from the law. Nor is it to say that we as believers, because we have faith, no longer have to do anything. We're completely free from works. The question is, what is the balance? And it is certainly not that you need either works or the law for salvation, and it is certainly not that you need works or the law for sanctification. Both of those, according to Scripture, are the result of faith in Christ and the grace of God extended to you as a believer because you have trusted in Jesus Christ alone. You remember back in Acts chapter 15, we read, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. And Paul answers that. Verse 3 of Galatians 3. He's writing now after the council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. Do you not understand that if you place yourself under one part of the law, you are a debtor to do the whole law? How many of you traveled more than a Sabbath day journey today to get to church? How many of you have had pork within the last year? 
you understand there are some things about the law that if you have to go under the law for anything you are a debtor to do the whole law had any shrimp recently shellfish were prohibited under the law you see folks we are not under the law but under grace that does not mean that there are not standards that God has set forth based upon his character and based upon our relationship with Christ and our love for Christ but they are not based on Mount Sinai they are not based on the law the law will never motivate you nor will it empower you to keep the perfect righteousness of God it simply can't if the law is merely your standard by which you therefore in the flesh attempt to do good you will wear yourself out and you will not accomplish your goal in any case only when you walk in the Spirit which is the end of Galatians chapter 5 only when the Holy Spirit controls your life and your motivation is your love for Christ and your desire to serve him empowered by the Spirit of God only then can you walk by faith and bear the fruit of the Spirit which is listed for us at the end of this chapter when therefore verse 2 of Acts 15 Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question and being brought on their way by the church they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria declaring the conversion of the Gentiles and they caused great joy unto all the brethren when they were come to Jerusalem they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders and they declared all things that God had done with them now remember the first problem was saying you had to keep the law of Moses to be saved now we find the second problem also covered in the book of Galatians it takes us just five verses out of Acts chapter 15 to see the two problems and it takes Paul an entire book of the New Testament to answer those two problems what is Christian Liberty and what is legalism there rose up a certain sect of the Pharisees which believed these were saved Pharisees it says so in the text saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses okay it's not necessary for salvation these guys agreed with that but it's needful if they really want to live the Christian life they got to keep the law if they really want to be sanctified it's needful for them to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses that was the big issue back in the New Testament Church that was the very first key topic debated, debated at the very first mother of all church councils in Acts 15 there had been a first wave of missionaries preaching the truth there was a second wave of missionaries that went out preaching false doctrine you know we see that happening today in some of the Bible translation societies which are changing things in the text so that we don't quote offend Muslims no longer calling God father in their translations but calling him the great one or something like that no longer calling Jesus the son of God although God has spoken and has not stuttered and God called him my son this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased they call him something else instead so they won't offend Muslims because Muslims don't believe that God has a son listen if you preach any other gospel than that which you have received you are accursed Paul says so Galatians chapter 1 that's the point of the book of Galatians false gospels Paul says if we are an angel of light preaches unto you any other thing than that you have received let him be accursed don't change scripture you get yourself into the same trouble that the church got into back in the book of Acts and which Paul has to spend an entire book of the New Testament writing about and God made sure that we got copies of that so that we would not fall into the same kinds of either apostasy deals with salvation or heresy deals with sanctification Jesus 
made it very clear that we are not under the law but under grace and so did the Apostle Paul the law was given by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ John chapter 1 now in the church today modern America there are many things that are very tempting to either grab for a means of salvation or more frequently in evangelical churches for a means of sanctification one of those of course is the issue of baptism there are those who teach baptism for salvation the Church of Christ has five steps to salvation water baptism by immersion being one of them and it has to be in their tank and it has to be by one of their ministers and it has to have a specific formula and it has to be done unto repentance and if you leave any of that out your salvation didn't take that's the so-called Church of Christ very big in the south not too big around the north but we have one here in Collingswood they teach water baptism is necessary for salvation others like the Roman Catholics teach it is necessary not only for the salvation of the infant which then you can lose and gain and lose and gain and so on a lot of um, wishy-washy in that but um, it's also to keep the baby out of purgatory it's also to get rid of original sin there are all kinds of heresies attached to it with Rome there are those in some extreme reformed groups who have adopted that heresy like the fire group the fellowship of independent reformed evangelicals Reverend Peter Lightheart wrote a book on the subject teaching that baptism of infants is necessary for their salvation he's reformed so-called some of the ultra reformed circles have even gone so far as to teach that pedo communion that is giving communion to babies is necessary for their salvation which is very close to what Rome teaches about the mass being necessary for keeping your salvation you see that's what gives the priest the power of excommunication he can cut you off he can withhold your salvation until you get in line with Rome my point is that the heart issue in Acts 15 and in Galatians 5 which is our text today is exactly the same only the symbolic act is different the real struggle is with the doctrine of grace with the doctrine of faith is salvation by grace plus some work of man or by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone the second issue that's raised there in Acts 15 and that's dealt with in detail in the book of Galatians is the issue of sanctification sanctification means to be set apart set apart for service in the case of the believer God sets us apart for service he sets us apart unto himself we're actually prior to our salvation set apart to salvation according to first Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 13 and 14 believing Jews here in Acts 15 were teaching circumcision was needful in other words you really can't live the Christian life without circumcision circumcision and law-keeping that's what Paul is fighting when he writes to the Gentile churches of Galatia in Galatians 5 heretics had infiltrated the church and whichever way you go either with legalism or with libertinism you do not have liberty in Christ is a day in which we celebrate liberty but be careful to make sure that your liberty is the liberty described in Scripture and it doesn't go off the deep end on the legalism side and doesn't go off the deep end on the libertine side whereby there are no restrictions at all we have real believers like those Pharisees in Acts 15 today who focus on different issues using that same issue that we had a moment ago of baptism they say one you cannot fully enter into the Christian life until you're baptized or they say you cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit until you're baptized much like the Pentecostals who claim that you cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit until you speak in tongues or third they will tell you that your disobedience and failing to be baptized means that you cannot properly exercise your spiritual gifts we've studied the 22 spiritual gifts that were given to the church seven of them temporary gifts given only during the apostolic period and the rest are available today 
like the gift of pastor teacher, the gift of teacher, the gift of evangelist, gift of helps, and so on. Gift of giving for those who want to be tightwads. God has given us spiritual gifts, and there are those who will tell you that disobedience and failing to be baptized, or being baptized what they think is the wrong way, will mean that you cannot properly exercise your spiritual gift. Some will say that you cannot lead others to Christ, or you cannot teach the scripture with power until you're water baptized by a particular mode. Some say that you cannot bear the fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5 unless you've been baptized by a particular mode of water baptism. But that's totally contrary to the point of Galatians 5. There is no work of man that can hinder the work of the Spirit of God. Now, if you're in absolute rebellion, of course, you're not going to be doing what God wants you to do. If you're in rebellion against God, you're not going to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit and so on. But it's not the issue, just like with circumcision, because Paul circumcised Timothy for a very specific reason and refused to circumcise Titus for another very specific reason. It's not the external act that's important. It's your relationship with Christ. It is your relationship with Christ. Where are you in that relationship? Have you trusted him? Are you saved? If you're saved, are you walking in fellowship? Walking in the light as he is in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ cleansing your sins as you're walking in the light. Seeking in every way that you can to be obedient to the word of God. Different motivation, not the law of Sinai, but your relationship with Christ. How is your relationship with Christ? You say you've trusted in Christ. You say you his, he is your savior. How has that relationship changed your life? Not how has two stone tablets over which you keep hitting yourself in the head changed your life. How has your relationship with Christ changed your life? By the Spirit of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the Word of God. By the walk of faith. There's a difference, people. You may see similar results externally, but the way you get to the external results makes all the difference in the world. Is it because you are filled with the Spirit of God that you do the things that you do? Or is it because you are struggling in the flesh to accomplish some work of the flesh to get merit with God, either for salvation or for sanctification? What is it that empowers you? What is it that motivates you to obey God? The one is a burden filled with chains. The other is the liberty of the Spirit of God. That's the liberty that Paul's talking about here in our text today in Galatians chapter 5. The second problem requiring a particular mode or the act of baptism for salvation or sanctification is that Paul specifically states that baptism was not part of the commission that Christ gave him. Baptism was part of the commission that Christ gave to the other apostles and to the Gospel of Matthew, very clearly so. But it was not part of the commission that Christ gave to Paul when Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Paul clearly baptized. He says so in the context, and he lists lots of people whom he baptized. But it was not part of his commission. 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That means it's not part of the gospel. People who teach that you have to be baptized to be saved are teaching a false gospel. Anybody who says you have to be baptized to be saved is teaching a false gospel. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ, there's the heart of the gospel, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Be very careful when you connect an external symbol to the full Christian life as a necessary requirement. When you do that, you are fallen from grace. When you do that, you have left Christian liberty, God's definition, not the world's definition of liberty, but you have left God's liberty and placed yourself back under the chain. 
Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not denying that the external symbols are important. The external symbols are very important as a testimony to the reality of what you have experienced. God gave external symbols in Scripture and he judged seriously those who broke the symbols. For example, Moses in the Old Testament, the first time God said to him, smite the rock. So Moses smote the rock and water gushed out. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that the rock that followed them was Christ. Christ was smitten once. The second time, Moses in great frustration, the people were complaining because they didn't have any water again. And so God said to Moses, speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. Now, most of us would think that that's kind of crazy, talking to rocks. <laughs> but God told Moses to speak to the rock. Because you see, after the cross, it's not necessary that Christ be smitten a second time to ask for his blessing and for his forgiveness. All you need is to speak. But Moses took his rod and he smote the rock and he said, What ye rebels, must we bring ye forth water out of this rock? As though he's doing it. Must we bring you forth water out of the rock? God in his grace gave water to Israel. But God said to Moses, because you've smitten the rock this second time, you will not go into the promised land. You'll see it, but you get, won't get to go in. Because he got mad once. Because he hit the rock a second time. God counts his symbols as very important. You don't ignore the symbols. It's just you don't put the symbols in the wrong place. You don't give credit to the symbols for what is the reality. Another one. God gave marriage as a representation of Christ and his bride, the church. Paul says so, Ephesians chapter 5. That is supposed to portray the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. That's why marriage is until death do you part, not until you finally get mad at each other so that you divorce. Jesus never divorces his bride, the church. The church has eternal security in Christ. Marriage is until death. Folks, don't marry if you think that you're going to have a way out somewhere down the road. It's for all of life. God counts that relationship very important because in the book of Hebrews, he says, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You see, the marriage relationship represents the reality of Christ and the church. You can go through many symbols in scripture. God counts the symbols as holy and very important. You look at the Lord's table, a symbol that God has given to us. Because there were people at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, who were violating that symbol. They were coming to the Lord's table. Some were getting drunk and some were gluttonizing and some people weren't getting anything at all. Paul says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. They had been violating a symbol. Not because the symbol was the reality, but because the symbol pointed to the truth. So I am not denying symbols when I am talking about what I've given you today. I'm saying the symbol is not a means of grace. It is a reflection of grace already received through faith in Christ alone. We do it in memory of him, in remembrance. It's a memorial. It is not an effective agent. How important that is for us to learn. The symbols are not means of grace. They do not impart grace. We need to make sure that 
what we're teaching is grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. The battle cries of the Reformation, the solas of the Reformation. Now listen carefully to one other point that Paul is making here in Galatians chapter 5. Many people twist this freedom from the law to deny grace in another way. They turn the grace of God, as Paul uses the phrase, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. What is lasciviousness? Aselgia. Aselgia, the word translated lasciviousness, means freedom to commit gross immoral sin. We're not under the law, so let us sin that grace may abound. Paul says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You're dead to sin. Christian liberty, Christian freedom is not freedom to sin in the most gross and possibly immoral ways that you can think of. Paul says that when you do this, you deny the redemptive work of Christ. Christ not only redeemed us from the curse of the law, but redemption includes freedom from the bondage of sin. Sin brings you into bondage. Freedom is not bondage. Not only are you free from being under the chains of the law, but you are free from being under the chains of sin. You see, libertinism says go over to sin. You're, you're no longer chained up by the law, so uh, take some different chains on. Take on the chains of sin over here. That's lasciviousness. Freedom is a balance in the Christian life. I would encourage you, if you can find old copies of it, the newer copies have all kinds of weird modern versions used in them, but older copies of the balanced Christian life by Charles Ryrie, which used the traditional King James text. Balancing the Christian life is very much like a walk on a tight wire across a giant pond, and on one side of the pond there are alligators, and on the other side of the pond there are hippopotami. And you can fall off either way, but you're going to get eaten and crunched if you fall off. You don't want to be under the chains of the law. You don't want to be under the chains of sin. You want to walk by grace, faith, keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye become wearied and faint in your minds. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't keep your eyes on Mount Sinai. Don't keep your eyes on all the world around you and all the cool things that they're doing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Book of Galatians is the deep war. The deep war between law and grace. The deep war between faith and works for salvation and sanctification. Galatians 5, 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You know the key verses, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Grace and faith do not deny good works. Grace and faith are the empowerment for good works, which God has predestined before ordained that we should walk in them. Works follow salvation. Works do not produce salvation. The works are an external manifestation that the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is occurring. The works are not a means of achieving sanctification. Like salvation, sanctification is by grace through faith. Paul says so, Acts 26, 17 and 18. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Remember, Galatians is written to Gentiles, okay? to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Now listen to the last phrase in verse 
18. Not merely salvation by faith, but sanctification by faith. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Sanctification, like salvation, is grounded in the cross of Christ. It is not grounded in the works of men. It is grounded in the grace of God to men and grace alone. Hebrews 10.10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not merely saved, but sanctified at the cross. Sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Our time is up, but I want to mention one other thing. Practical Christianity. Practical Christianity. What you really believe determines how you will live. What you really believe will transform your life so that ultimately you are acting out in your life what you really believe. That's why the evolutionists act out as they do, and some are very consistent, like Jeffrey Dahmer, who became convinced that evolution was true and therefore the survival of the fittest was the right way to go, and so he raped and murdered many women. Because after all, it doesn't matter. There is no God, there is no restraint, there is no responsibility. He was a Darwinist. He was a consistent Darwinist. The captain of the Samson, the ship that was within sight of the Titanic as it was sinking, turned off his lights and backed away into the darkness and let those people drown. It had not been for the captain of the Carpathia, the ship that rescued them, none of them would have survived. The captain of the Samson was a Darwinist. The captain of the Carpathia was a Christian. Dear people, what you believe, what you really believe deep down in your heart will transform your life. And if you understand the scripture and believe the scripture, you will experience the most incredible liberty in Christ. You will not be bound by the chains of the law. You will not be bound by the chains of sin. You will be keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. You will be walking by faith. You will be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God. Not a matter of keeping rule number 732 in your rule book, but you'll be doing what is pleasing to him because you're walking by faith. God has standards. Oh, he doesn't want you to commit adultery. He doesn't want you to steal. He doesn't want you to murder and all this. But it's not a matter of trying to keep the rules over here. It's a matter of saying, I yield my members to Christ. Romans chapter 6. I've yielded my body to Christ once and for all. Aorist tense. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. That's a once and for all time thing that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you want God's will for your life? Present your body a living sacrifice. If you've never done it, Make a once and for all presentation. Your body belongs to Christ. When he died on the cross, he bought you lock, stock, and barrel. Body, soul, and spirit. And your body is to glorify him. Moral purity, holiness in all your thoughts, in all that comes out of your mouth, every attitude, every motivation. Empowered by the Spirit of God. You can't do it in the flesh. Paul says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. The Christian life. The Christian walk. It's by grace alone. Through faith alone. In Christ alone. When you don't walk that way, when you have a liberty that is not a biblical liberty, you will cause other Christians to stumble 
1 Corinthians 8, 9. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. When you are not walking that way, your liberty will hurt your conscience and the conscience of others. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? But when you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll have liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But just remember, you've got enemies. There will be those who try to convince you the other way. Paul says so in Galatians chapter 5. Remember those two verses that we read? Verses 13 and 14. That because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Don't use your liberty the wrong way. Peter says, 1 Peter 2.16, as free and not lose, using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. But those who want to drag you back under bondage, they'll say, you're not under the law, but it's okay for you to sin. Peter talks about them in 2 Peter 2.19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. Remember, the chains are on both sides of the path. Remember Christian as he walked in Pilgrim's Progress. Remember all the things that beset him. There are two types of chains. There are the chains of the law. There are the chains of licentiousness, the bondage of sin. We've been called to walk in the Spirit by faith. So the question, free to do what? According to the book of Galatians, according to the teaching of the entire New Testament, we are free to do what we ought, not free to do what we want. You see, when you don't have power, you're not free. But we have been empowered by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God. Now we are free to do what we ought, not free to do what we want. Because now we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, and we are free to do the will of God, which we could not do before. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word and for its power. We thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. Oh, Father, we are so easily tempted because we're an organized kind of a people. We as Bible Presbyterians want to be organized, and that's great. But, Father, sometimes we're tempted to put ourselves back under the law instead of walking by grace and by faith. Empowered by the Spirit of God, not empowered by the flesh, not empowered by the rule book, but empowered by the Spirit of God. Help us not to be drawn the other way. Too many, especially the young people of this generation who have rejected the legalisms of the past, have now decided to throw it all away. And we see our society filled with reprobation, with the grossest forms of immorality, with strident rebellion against the living God. But you've called us to walk in the Spirit. And the one who walks in the Spirit will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You've called us to walk by faith. And as the Holy Spirit moves in each of our hearts and lives, and as he empowers us and strengthens us, he doesn't lead us to the wild extremes. Instead, he causes us to bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no 
law. Father, make us your people transformed by your word and cause us to manifest the grace of God, the faith of Christ, transformed lives not because we've worked it out but in your grace you have molded us and shaped us into the image of Christ for we pray it in Jesus name Amen our closing hymn for today again a patriotic hymn number 807 807 let's